So if you're losing your hair in 2020, the good news is there's probably never been a better time to be going bold. At this point, we now have the most cutting edge hair loss treatment ever, and it's only going to get better and better. Guys, in this video, I'm going to be telling you all about how we got here, the story of how the field of hair loss treatment started out and all the major developments that brought us to where we are today. At the end of the video, we'll make an assessment of the progress made and see what the future might hold. Guys, you're going to love today's video. Stay tuned. Hey guys, Leon here from HairGod.com, where people who are worried about their hair loss go to regrow their hair. Guys, in this mega guide, we have got a lot to go through. So I've put timestamps for you in the description and in the comment section, so you can follow wherever you want to. And guys, just before we get into it, if you're personally worried about your hair loss, then don't forget to click the link in the description to take the HairGod hair loss quiz. You'll answer a few short and simple questions about yourself and your hair, and you'll receive free, personalized, expert advice on how to regrow it. So guys, into the video. Guys, hair loss has been a problem for men since, well, there were men. So unsurprisingly, we find all sorts of bizarre hair loss treatments in ancient texts. The ancient Egyptians, for example, famously applied a concoction made of various animal fats on the scalp. The fats came from crocodiles, hippopotami, and snakes. Sadly, we don't have any records as to how well the treatment worked out for them, but it's not difficult to guess. Now guys, one of the most famous men in history to suffer from pattern hair loss was the father of medicine himself, the ancient Greek Hippocrates. Hippocrates tried various formulas to stave off his hair loss. One included a blend of opium, horseradish, beetroot, various spices, and pigeon droppings. Yep, you heard that right, pigeon droppings. While his hair loss formula left a lot to be desired, we can credit Hippocrates with one very insightful observation. You can say that this single observation laid the foundation for all modern hair loss science. Hippocrates noticed that eunuchs, men who had been castrated, never went bold. He came to this realization whilst observing the eunuchs of the Persian king, who were responsible for guarding his harem. He attributed this to their lack of, quote, hot blood. So normal virile men who hadn't been castrated had hot blood running through their body, and this could often lead to boldness. Eunuchs didn't have any hot blood and hence never went bold. Now we will return to Hippocrates later in the video. But for now, let's skip a lot of not so important developments and fast forward a couple of millennia to the 1920s. The 1920s is when the discovery of the hair growth cycle happened, and you could say that the modern hair loss science started with this discovery. Now today, the hair cycle is something that we all learn about in school, so we kind of take it for granted. But it wasn't at all evident back then. After all, if you think about it, if you leave your hair to grow, it'll presumably just keep on growing and growing, right? We've all seen photos of women with hair down to their knees or even the ground. So on the face of it, there's not actually that much to suggest that hair grows in cycles. Well, in 1924, an American researcher called Mildred Trotter suggested for the first time that we all undergo such a hair cycle. But it would actually be two years later, in 1926, that a German researcher by the name of Dry described the hair cycle in detail. Dry did his work with mice, and he coined the rather unfortunate names that we still use to describe the cycle to this day. Now, the growth phase, which is by far the longest lasting of the three, and typically lasts for years, was called anagen. During this phase, the hair just keeps on growing and growing. The very brief regression phase that follows he called catagen. In catagen, the hair follicle starts to shrink, but the old hair still doesn't fall out. This happens in the final phase, the resting phase, which he called telogen. In telogen, the old hair falls out, making room for the new anagen hair that is coming. And then the cycle starts all over again. Now, most of the hair loss treatments available today work primarily by altering the relative durations of these stages. They extend the growth phase of the cycle at the expense of the other two phases. The result is more actively growing hairs and fewer falling hairs. Together, these two effects result in a thicker head of hair. Now, we'll come back to this shortly. Now, the other major development that took place around this time was the first ever experimental hair transplants. These were taking place in the late 1930s in Japan, right on the eve of the Second World War. The technique that the Japanese developed was called punch grafting. This was literally about punching small holes in the hairy back of the scalp, 
kind of like you punch a hole through a piece of paper with a hole puncher. Now the diameter of each of these grafts was several millimeters in diameter. The intact grafts were then transplanted onto the balding area of the head. The area from which the punch grafts were removed is nowadays called the donor area of the scalp, and the area where the grafts are replanted is called the recipient area. Dr. Okuda, who was the dermatologist behind this revolutionary technique, didn't develop it for male pattern baldness. His motivation was actually to help victims of burn wounds and other injuries to the scalp. Now, unfortunately, when the war broke out, Dr. Okuda's work was forgotten and the technique was lost for a few years. It would be in the early 1950s that surgeons in the US rediscovered punched graft transplants and the name of the New York surgeon who conducted the first groundbreaking procedures was Dr. Norman Orentreich. This guy was pretty much a genius. Apart from all sorts of contributions to cosmetic surgery, he would actually later go on to launch a series of wildly successful skincare products with the company Clinique. So Orentreich's method was very similar to Okuda's, and it came to be despairingly known as hair plugs. The problem was, though it was truly groundbreaking technology, was that hair plugs kind of sucked. The whole purpose of a cosmetic procedure like a hair transplant is to give natural looking results. But guys, as you can see in this photo, these were anything but. The end result was very coarse, pluggy and unnatural, very similar to the hair of a doll. Hair plugs gave hair transplantation quite a bad name and it would actually take several decades for the field to recover. We'll come back to how hair surgeons eventually redeem themselves in a few minutes. But now guys, our story takes us to an oral antihypertensive medication that was synthesized in 1963. This medication hit the market in the 1970s under the brand name Loniten. So Loniten was an antihypertensive, which is just a fancy way of saying that it lowered blood pressure. And the way it did this was by widening the blood vessels. Wider blood vessels mean more blood can flow and the pressure drops. The FDA approved Loniten in 1971, but due to the side effects, put a two week limit on the duration of the treatment. But since the drug was so effective in lowering blood pressure, many doctors kept their patients on it for far longer than two weeks. And before long, these doctors started reporting an unexpected side effect many of their patients' hair were growing back. So it wasn't long before the prospect of using the drug to treat hair loss was apparent. But Upjohn, the pharmaceutical company who brought Loniten to the market, still had their hands full getting full FDA approval of the medication of hypertension. Trying to get the drug licensed for hair loss was the last thing on their mind. So it would only be in 1978 that Upjohn finally began trials of Loniten for baldness. This was almost a decade after the first reported cases of hair growth. So Loniten, as you might have guessed by now, was the brand name for minoxidil. After the clinical trials were successfully completed, minoxidil was finally approved by the FDA for male pattern baldness in 1988. The form approved was a liquid solution that you applied topically to the scalp and it was sold under the brand name Rogaine. Rogaine was the first ever drug to gain FDA approval for hair loss and this marked a watershed in the history of hair loss research. You see, up until that point, not only was there no real answers for pattern baldness, but many of the treatments that were available were pretty much bizarre. So the field already had a very bad reputation and just the idea of hair loss treatments conjured notions of quackery among doctors and the general public. Overnight, the FDA approval of minoxidil changed all of that. The world of hair loss would never be the same again. Essentially, the field was now legitimized, and scientific research, which had previously been practically non-existent, started to pour in. Now, around the time that minoxidil was being trialed and going through the various stages of marketing authorization, another breakthrough was taking place in the field of hair transplants. Remember those nasty hair plugs that we were talking about a minute ago? Well, up until the early 90s, these were still the status quo in transplant technology. So if you went to your surgeon for some new hair, then you were getting hair plugs. That was it. But in the 1980s, a handful of surgeons, and I literally do mean a handful, started to go beyond hair plugs. These surgeons started to experiment with the transplantation of so-called follicular units. So what are follicular units? Well, if you look at a human scalp under magnification, you can see that most hairs don't grow out on their own. Instead, they come out in groupings of one to four hairs, and these groupings are the so-called follicular units. In between follicular units, there's basically just a lot of bald skin. So by blindly punching holes in the back of the head and transplanting relatively large circular grafts, 
you're mostly transplanting bold, useless skin. Now, this not only causes unnecessary damage to the donor area of the scalp, but as we've seen, it gives extremely poor cosmetic results. Now, believe it or not, up until the 1980s, most hair surgeons did not even appreciate the existence of follicular units, let alone their importance in cosmetic hair surgery. Follicular unit transplantation was born out of the realization that you get the best, most natural results if you transplanted individual follicular units. You do this by removing an entire strip of hair from the back of the scalp. You then dissect this strip under a microscope down to its individual follicular units. These follicular units are then transplanted one by one into tiny incisions that are carefully made in the bolding area of the scalp. The transplanted follicles fit snugly into the incisions. They heal up quickly and leave no scars. And the strip of scalp that you remove from the back of the head? Well, that's stitched up, which then stretches the scalp and effectively removes the site of the strip. Sure, you get a permanent scar, but this is hidden under the hair where nobody can see it. So fantastic results all around. More and more doctors started using follicular unit transplantation, which the public quickly started referring to as strip excision. By 1996, strip excision had gone mainstream and there was a new gold standard in hair transplants. With strip excision for the first time ever, surgeons were able to give a balding man a more natural looking appearance. For the first time in history, money could actually buy you at least some hair. So you have this very short time frame between 1988 when minoxidil hits the market and 1996 when strip excision goes mainstream where the field of hair loss is profoundly transformed. You have more mainstream medical progress in this small eight year span than the entire prior history of hair loss medicine. Another advance in transplantation technology would take place about a decade later with the advent of follicular unit extraction, or FUE. In FUE, the unit of transplantation was once again the follicular unit, but the difference was in how the follicular unit was removed from the back of the head. Rather than removing an entire strip of scalp and then dissecting it under a microscope, FUE removed individual follicular units from the back of the head one by one. This was achieved using very fine surgical instruments. So with FUE, you don't get a large strip in this donor area, and this means that there are no permanent scars. The scars left when you remove individual follicular units are tiny, so they heal up very quickly and don't leave a trace. Today, the majority of transplant clinics around the world perform FUE, but strip excision is still widely practiced and gives good results that can be just as good as FUE. The days of hair plugs and doll hair are gone forever. Now, remember how we said that minoxidil originally hit the market as a drug against hypertension before doctors realized that it also regrew hair? Well, that's actually only half of the story. The research program that led to the development of minoxidil was originally focused on the treatment of ulcers. And whilst that program didn't have any success with ulcers, the researchers at Upjohn quickly realized that they were successfully treating high blood pressure. And then after minoxidil was developed for hypertension, you had the unexpected hair regrowth. So there really was no theory behind minoxidil. It was all just happenstance and stumbling in the dark, which explains why even today, nobody knows for sure exactly what minoxidil does to the hair follicles or how it stimulates hair growth. There's a lot of different theories out there, but these were all made up after the fact that nobody really knows. But just a few years after minoxidil was finally marketed for boldness, another drug hit the market. The drug's name was Propecia and the active ingredient was called finasteride. Now the history of finasteride's development couldn't be more different to that of minoxidil. Finasteride was developed as the result of chemical engineers and clinical scientists being guided by theory and having a clear understanding of the immediate cause of pattern boldness. The origins of this understanding can be traced all the way back to Hippocrates' original observations with eunuchs more than 2000 years ago. Since eunuchs are castrated, they can only produce very small quantities of androgens, the male hormone. This is because most of the androgen production in the male body is in one way or another linked to the testicles. Remove the testicles and you basically wipe out the androgens. By the 20th century, there was loads of evidence that corroborated Hippocrates' observations and pointed to androgens as the immediate cause of male pattern boldness. This evidence came not only from eunuchs, but also from other groups of males with rare genetic abnormalities. These abnormalities caused very low levels of androgens, and like eunuchs, these men would also never go bold. But scientists still hadn't identified precisely which of the various androgens 
was the culprit. The answer finally came with a report in the prestigious journal Science in 1974. The authors of the report identified a group of males with a rare genetic mutation in a small village called Salinas in the Dominican Republic. The children born with this rare genetic mutation were genetically male, but due to their ambiguous appearance, they were raised as girls. And when I actually say ambiguous, their penis and testicles were so small that they were mistaken for female genitalia. But during puberty, they started to develop secondary male characteristics, like a deepened voice and increased muscle mass. And at the same time, they also started to develop full-sized penises and testicles, much to the surprise of the parents and everyone in the community. Now, crucially for our discussion, these individuals were also immune to pattern boldness. The researchers correctly identified that the androgen that these individuals lacked was not actually testosterone, but rather another male hormone. The name of this hormone, you guessed it, was DHT, short for dihydrotestosterone. All normally functioning men convert some of the testosterone in their body to DHT. They do this via an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. But due to the genetic mutation they had inherited, the people in these studies lacked this enzyme and their body couldn't convert their testosterone to DHT. So the reason eunuchs never went bold wasn't because they lacked testosterone per se, but because they lacked DHT, which is made from testosterone. Now, apart from boldness, the other problem these 5-alpha reductase deficient subjects never had to worry about was prostate enlargement. Prostate enlargement is a very common problem that affects approximately 1 in 2 men by the age of 50 and over 90% by age 80. It's not life-threatening but can interfere with normal urination and a lower quality of life. It didn't take long after the report in Science was published for the executives at the pharmaceutical company Merck to connect the dots. Sure, DHT was critical for the development of the sex organs while the male was in the womb but during adulthood, it didn't seem to do much. Its only apparent contributions in adult men were receding hairlines and enlarged prostates. So Merck set out developing a drug that could mimic the effects of 5-alpha reductase deficiency in otherwise healthy males who suffered from prostate enlargement. Now, in case you're wondering why Merck focused on prostate enlargement rather than hair loss, well, is the fact is that Prostate enlargement is a much larger market. Soon, the engineers at Merck developed a very promising compound with the code name MK906. This was remarkably effective in blocking DHT by inhibiting the function of 5-alpha reductase. In this way, it achieved what had been the goal, replicate, to a large extent, the hormonal makeup of pseudohermaphrodites with 5-alpha reductase deficiency. MK906 was eventually named finasteride, and in 1992 received FDA approval for the treatment of benign prostatic hyperlasia, which is the scientific name for prostate enlargement. After the drug had been marketed for this indication, the company was able to focus its resources on getting approval for the indication of male pattern hair loss. In 1997, finasteride was approved for hair loss by the FDA and hit the market as Propecia in a 1mg pill that was to be taken daily. A few years after finasteride, another drug with a very similar mechanism of action hit the market. The drug was called Dutasteride and was sold under the brand name Avodart. Dutasteride is currently licensed only for prostate enlargement in the United States, though it works just as well for finasteride for hair loss. To this day, minoxidil and finasteride are the only two FDA-approved medications for the treatment of baldness. But there is now more research in this field than ever before, and it's only a matter of time before more drugs come to market. Now guys, we have left one of the most important developments in the fight against hair loss for the end. And this is the arrival of the internet. If you look through our past videos, you can see that at this point we have dozens, if not hundreds of videos on various aspects of hair loss. Hair God's focus is primarily on natural or quote, alternative treatments to hair loss, but we also do a lot of videos on prescription medications like finasteride and minoxidil. And on our blog at hairgod.com, you can also find hundreds of articles on these topics. Now, none of this would have been possible, say, a mere 25 years ago. Back then, if you found that you were losing your hair, your only option was basically to go to your dermatologist and hear what he had to say. After that, there was really no other option left, other than maybe get the opinion of a second dermatologist. But he would probably tell you the exact same thing the first one told you. After all, they're all following the same set of guidelines and best practice. But now, in 2020, if you find your hair falling, the dermatologist will no longer have the privilege of being your only source of information. Many guys out there won't even go to their dermatologist, and if they do, it won't be until they've done their own research. Through the internet and all sorts of free resources like Google Scholar, PubMed, 
popular science website, videos like these, you name it, there's no limit to how much a man can educate himself without leaving his house and without paying a penny. Not to mention the opportunity to join the online community of men with hair loss and be able to exchange experience, ideas and suggestions directly without a middleman and without any single entity like the FDA or the government managing things. And this would have been unthinkable just a few years ago. Now sure, you can find all sorts on the internet and there is a lot of junk and snake oil being peddled out there no doubt about it. But on the other hand, there's now no excuse for not taking responsibility, for not doing your homework and educating yourself when it comes to your hair care routine and what you put in your mouth and on your scalp. You see, one of the major problems with the FDA and the mainstream medical establishment built around is its circular logic. Most dermatologists' logic is that if it's not FDA approved, it hasn't been proven. And if it hasn't been proven, then you best stay away from it. But getting FDA approval for a treatment requires a ton of regulatory compliance and running clinical trials that cost many millions of dollars. Unless you're a large pharmaceutical company with deep pockets, you're just not going to be able to afford all of this. And if you are a pharmaceutical company, you will obviously have no interest in testing natural hair loss products. Because natural products can't be patented. And if they can't be patented, there's just no money to be made, even if the FDA approves them. So this creates a vicious catch-22, where the FDA has effectively labelled all natural treatments as unproven, and this line of thinking dominates mainstream hair loss medicine. But now, because of the internet, you can do your own research and come to your own conclusions. So you can decide for yourself if, say, caffeine is unproven. Or if essential oils are unproven. or if scalp massages or products like a grow brand which we've covered exhaustively on previous videos and on the hair god website are unproven similarly for micro needling which is a very simple low cost yet very powerful method for promoting hair growth and the list goes on and on Okay, so I did promise you I'd give you my thoughts on where the science of hair loss stands today and what we can expect for the future. Now guys, if I had to summarise the field in one sentence, it would be unfinished business. And this refers both to our understanding, the theory of how pattern baldness works, as well as the treatments that we've developed so far. So the central development in our current understanding of hair loss has been the identification of DHT. DHT is the immediate cause of pattern hair loss in men, and there is no doubt about that today. Not only for the evidence we covered in today's video, but from various other lines of research which we cannot go into in a short video like this. So men who, for whatever reason, don't have DHT, don't go bold. And blocking DHT production in balding men often stops the progression of hair loss. But herein lies a big mystery. And the mystery is this. If DHT is the immediate cause of baldness, which we know it is, then why doesn't blocking DHT work for all men? Why do many men still continue to lose their hair after being put on DHT blocking medications like finasteride and dutasteride? And why are we still unable to restore a balding head back to its original state, back to how it was before the onset of baldness? Because even the top responders to DHT blocking medications will only regrow some of their hair, and generally in parts of the hair that have only just thinned out. Or once an area of the head has gone completely bold, it cannot grow back. Once the hairline has receded, it cannot be restored, even if you remove every last molecule of DHT from the body. We are definitely missing something. There's at least one more factor involved in hair loss that goes beyond DHT and we don't yet fully understand it. And until it's identified, there's probably only so much progress that we'll be able to make. Having said that, the way science and technology are headed, we might still be able to do miracles in the near future, even if we don't fully understand hair loss just yet. For example, in recent years, there's been tremendous progress in identifying the genetic basis of the predisposition to baldness. We're starting to get a hazy outline of the genes involved and the mode of genetic transmission. So in the not so distant future, we might be able to tell the moment a child is born if and when he's likely to start developing male pattern baldness by something as simple as a DNA test. And since preventing or stopping hair loss is infinitely easier than reversing it, a big part of future efforts might be directed towards prevention, 
towards stopping these vulnerable men from manifesting their predisposition to hair loss in the first place. This could be through any combination of oral treatments, topical lotions, mechanical stimulation of the scalp, you name it. Another possible area that we might be hearing a lot in the future is, is from stem cells. These could be a game changer. Already some surgeons and clinics are offering hair follicle stem cell transplants on an experimental basis. If the technology matures and lives up to expectations, well, getting your hair back might be as simple as going to your local clinic and getting a few stem cell injections on your head. Too good to be true? Maybe. We'll just have to wait and see. Guys, make sure to check out some of our other videos by clicking on the screen right now. This was Leon from HairGuard.com. Thank you.